Um, Beatitudes. All right, yeah, Beatitudes. Uh, so yeah, we're, we, we started this last week, um, talked about uh, last week how uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is a, just a, it's, it's one of the, the most um, uh, vital sermons and teachings that he ever gave to his disciples because the, the, whole, the whole message is about what it looks like to be a disciple. And the Beatitudes are his picture of what discipleship really looks like. Um, if, uh, as in John chapter 1, uh, for those who have received the right to be called children of God, Jesus is basically saying in the Beatitudes, this is what my children look like. These are the, these are the traits that they have. They're not a list of to-dos. The people read the Beatitudes as a list of to-dos, and I'm sorry if you've ever read them or been told to read them as a list of to-dos. Um, that is, a, that is a very, not a good way of looking at them um, because uh, what that means is you're trying to, you're trying to, to master a, a, a spiritual trait according to the flesh. That's, that's what you're trying to do. You basically, like you take the first one, to, blessed to be poor in spirit, and what you, you just, you translate that as, is, okay, well, I just have to walk around. I have, to, I have to be completely impoverished. I have to walk around. I have to sell everything that I own and, and just walk around as, you know, a, a person, you know, who lives on the streets. And that's, that's my, my life in Jesus. And um, I, I'm sorry, like, if that's ever been told to you, that's really missing the point. Uh, that wasn't what Jesus was saying. Jesus was talking about not a not an outward uh, you know, physical poverty that we should have, but it's a it's a spiritual state that we should be walking in. This is this is this is who we are as beings. We recognize above and and beyond all things our need for God and nothing else in this world. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't you know we can't you know have you know things of this world, but our identity as, as Christians, our identity as, as disciples of Jesus is no longer rooted in the things of this world. It's rooted in the things of God, which is a higher kingdom. So Jesus is laying out his, um, his vision. This is, this is what my disciples look like. Um, there's another way that you can take this. And I, I really want to like, develop this at one point in my life. Um, and I, I think that Jesus in the Beatitudes is actually talking about the gospel. He's talking about his gospel. He's, um, uh, you know, Jesus, <laughs> say this um, as, uh, you know, please don't shoot me. Um, I, I say this with a lot of, you know, just, just being careful. Um, when Jesus spoke, uh, he, he spoke as the son of God, right? But also, Jesus doesn't just pull things out of thin air. He, he does. Like he was like, he's the most purposeful, intentional uh, human that ever walked the earth. And so when he's speaking, he's not just like, oh yeah, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. That sounds like a good thing. Or, uh, you know, we're going to talk about uh, blessed, blessed are those who mourn. Oh, that's, that's really cool. That's a, that's a good thought. Let's, let's just, you know, pull on that one. Um, Jesus wasn't just, you know, kind of making this up as he went along. Um, Jesus, if you understand Jesus in the gospel as the fulfillment of Israel's story as told in the Old Testament, one of the things you begin to see is that Jesus, as he's talking, he's often uh, connecting what he's saying to something in the Old Testament. And I, I actually, I really believe, and I think the, the Beatitudes really speak this, all for, all for, for one, except for one Beatitude, um, which I don't want to spoil, but I'll tell you this. There's one beatitude that's mentioned uh, only once in the whole Bible. And that, that's, to me, that's interesting. Like this was, this, it's, not, it's not something that is mentioned after the, the beatitudes, and it's not something that's uh, aforementioned by the Old Testament. There's, there's nothing in the whole Bible, actually, that supports this thing that Jesus said. But I'll, I'll get to that if you're wondering, what is that? Uh, I'm going to keep you in suspense. I'm not going to ruin it. Um, the, um, uh, so Jesus wasn't just pulling these things out of thing. He's actually connecting to Old Testament scriptures. And um, that's important because until, 
until you see the Beatitudes in the light of the Old Testament and of what Jesus was actually saying, uh, because his audience, uh, they, were, they were good, you know, faithful. They tried to be as faithful as possible. Um, uh, good uh, Hebrews, good uh, synagogue-going Jews of uh, the day. And so when Jesus was, was making statements, he would make very certain statements, and they were recorded in the Gospels. And, and it's, it's assumed, it's often not, you know, it, it's not explicitly stated in, in the Bible and in the New Testament and even the Old Testament. But um, it, is, it should be assumed that when Jesus is speaking about something that sort of relates to the Old Testament, it should be assumed that his his followers or his audience knew what he was talking about. That's one of the, that's actually the, one of the key assumptions of the Bible is that uh, when the writers of the New Testament are quoting the Old Testament, they assume that their audience understands exactly what they're saying. And not only do that, Paul does this uh, very clearly. He uh, will make a reference to the Old Testament and then carry the whole theme of the passage through what he's writing about. It's really kind of one of those interesting dynamics. But, but it doesn't explicitly say what Paul is saying. Well, I'm quoting the Old Testament here and I'm carrying this theme. He assumes that his audience knows exactly what he's talking about. Because um, they actually, they didn't have scripture like we have it today. Um, they memorized everything. Uh, which for me is, a, that's a feat. That's <laughs> a feat. I really would, I would really love to do that. Um, the Beatitudes, if you notice their trajectory, is, it points to an upside down way of, of living. And that upside down, uh, upside down way of living, um, it always results in the presence of God. Every, every state, the, the, the blessedness, the, the uh, macarism uh, is the result of the blessedness is always God himself. It's like never anything material in this world. It's always uh, transcendent. It always is like it's, it's pointing to a different aspect of God. And so when Jesus is going through the Beatitudes and he's saying blessed is this, blessed is that, blessed is this, for theirs is this, and for theirs is that, for theirs is, is that over there, um, he is always pointing to that this state of blessedness that, that we live in, that we are, as a result of being his children, uh, it, it always results in more of God. It always results in having more of him and encountering more of his spirit, more of his presence, uh, a different attribute of his nature. And so we can try and make some sort of sense of like, oh, well, this is exactly what we get by that. But... I think that's, that's, again, missing the point, making it more of type of some sort of like material uh, list of, you know, kind of a cause and effect. You, you, if we look at the Beatitudes as a, well, if we do this, then we get this. And I, I just don't think that that is a, 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 a holistic, healthy way of viewing um, Scripture, because we're looking at it through the framework of this world rather than the framework of the kingdom of God. And, and when we look at it through the kingdom of God lens, um, the result is always more of the spirit, more of, more of the father, more of the son, more, more of God in our lives. Now, his, I'll, I'll qualify that statement, that his presence in our life, it means something. It, it, it means something. And, and oftentimes that, that presence of God for, um, for people throughout the Bible, it, it means, a, you know, materialistically, it means a whole slew of different things. But the, but the core, at the core, is that God is present. It's, it's his blessedness that we have. He is present. Whatever happens because of his presence with us is a result of his presence. But we shouldn't look for having his presence for the result. We should look for having his presence because he alone is worthy of 100% of our affection. So, um, this week, let's do this. Um, 
Blessed, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now, there's a few different ways that this passage can be taken. The first way that we can take this is, I would say, the very traditional um, way of taking it, that uh, we sort of think that, you know, Jesus is uh, writing or telling his followers that um, we, we ought to be the type of people who, you know, as it says in the Bible, mourn with those who mourn, grieve with those who grieve, laugh with those who laugh, that this is, this is sort of like a, um, a way of living our life where we just, you know, uh, we are aware of the pain that people are experiencing around us. And in this like sort of way of living, what we experience is we experience the blessedness of God that he is with us to comfort that person and he is with us to, um, to be comforted. You know, uh, that's one way of taking it. Has anybody ever like heard that verse taught that way? Like, oh you, yeah, you, as a good person, as a follower of Jesus, you, you mourn with people. This is what he said. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, I, you can get there f- from there. And I see how people take that trajectory because if, if you're just going by the plain reading of the text, you go, oh yeah, that's, that's exactly what Jesus was saying. Another thing that people think about uh, when they read this passage is um, the, God's presence with us in the midst of our, our suffering. And, and that is when we go through trial, when we go through, through suffering, when we have uh, health issues or financial issues or just even the, the, the general suffering that, that comes from this living in this, this fallen world. Um, we, we take this passage, and I've heard this taught several times, that we take, we take it and we, we go, oh, well, you know, this is, this is God's promise to us in the midst of whatever's going, around, going on around us or affecting our lives. We take that, and we say, oh, this is, this is just, you know, the pathway to receiving the blessedness of God. And I would definitely agree. Yeah, there's some implications here that um, what Jesus is saying actually does relate to our, our personal suffering. But also, I'll, I'll qualify that with this statement that later on in the Beatitudes, Jesus specifically does begin to address what uh, happens to his followers and the blessedness they receive by uh, the effects of living in a fallen world. And he actually mentions it twice uh, in in the last uh, two verses of the, the Beatitudes. Those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness and those who are persecuted for the sake of me, he says. Not me, not Caleb, but Jesus. Um, for not my name's sake. Uh, so he mentions this like this this lifestyle of, of suffering that as, as his followers living in this world, we, we are going to invite some sort of um, suffering. And so if the blessed are those who mourn has a, has a trajectory of uh, suffering in this world, I, my question is why would Jesus repeat himself three times? He repeats himself twice because it's very important for us to get this. But, but the last, like the very first one, blessed are those who mourn, why would he, why would he do that? And so my, my theory, and my, this is what I, I just, how I read this, this text, is that Jesus is in here talking about our own suffering. He, he's not talking about anything that's happening to us or any loss that we've, we face, but actually his point is something much, much larger. He's, he's pointing to something that's happening in the world. And in the midst of that, he's actually pointing to how he wants to change us in the midst of that, what's happening around us. Um, we see this in, we see the, these two views in, in Job. If you go to Job, I'm, I'm going to give you an encouraging word from Job today. You laugh. I know you've read Job. Um, the, uh, the reason... The reason I, I say that this is, this is about something much larger than just, um, you know, identifying with somebody's grief or even um, grieving in your own sense um, is because of the words that Jesus used. 
The, the first word that he uses for mourn is the word pentheo. And the second word that he uses for comforted is parakaleo. Um, these words are used multiple times throughout the Bible uh, in many, many different ways. If you recall, like the, the, the second one sounds very familiar to you. It's because this is the word that Jesus uses uh, in John chapter 14 when he says, hey, blessed, um, it's good to you that I go and be with my father because um, I'm going to send you, and we all know this word because you've heard me use it so many times. If you haven't, you probably know it because your former pastors taught about it. Um, as he should, you will receive the paraclete, right? Which is uh, a translation of the comforter, the Holy Spirit. This is who we get, right? So Jesus goes to the Father, says, good that I do this because I'm gonna send you a helper. Um, and so the word comfort there is the, is the, the root word for paraclete, um, but it's, it's actually in its sort of passive form. Um, and you see these words, you know, throughout the New Testament, you see parakaleo at, throughout the New Testament or in different forms. Uh, but pentheo, um, it, it means so much more than just grieving a loss. But this is how we take it. And this is, sort of shows up in Job. Um, if Job chapter 2 verse 11 says, when Job's, when Job's three friends, Eliphaz, the Temanite, I almost want to say termite, um, Bildad, the Shuahite, and Zophar, the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon Job, and you probably know about Job. He's lost everything. They set out from their homes, and they met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. So um, the, the word sympathize there is uh, if you... Uh, go to the Greek uh, Old Testament, which is one of the first uh, books or first Old Testament writings ever produced. Um, you would see this word pentheo, like they sympathize with him. And this is sort of, you know, what we kind of think about, you know, in a, a light sense of the beatitude. As, well, well, you know, sorry for your loss type of thing. They always just have sympathy for people in their, their, their troubles. But if you, if you jump down to verse 12, um, that Pentheo sort of sets the tone for the rest of the passage. Because it says, when they saw him from a distance, get this, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes, and they sprinkled dust on their heads. They sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, and no one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. That's a, you know, I always, as a pastor, I always have a, a hard time. Like when someone loses somebody, you always like, I, I just, I always don't want to just like do the, oh, I'm sorry for your loss type of thing. But I often find myself doing that. And uh, personally, I always wish like, I wish there was something deeper to say. Um, I wish there was, there was a, you know, more that I could do to, to express that I'm identifying with, you know, what they're going through. Um, and Job's friends kind of capture that. But they also capture this, this idea of pentheo, that it just goes beyond the, here's your condolence card, right? Here's your, here's your, your card. You, I'm sorry you lost your pet, you know, type of thing, um, to a deep agony, there is a, there's a, a deep, I mean, you, you see this, right? You see that, that, that what they're doing is, it, it, whatever happened to Job, when they saw it, it struck the very core of their being. It struck them at their heart. It, it, was, it was absolutely devastating. And this is what it really is. It's a deep expression of sorrow, and of regret, that's, that's what uh, pentheo means, is that it's the, the, the deepest possible expression of regret, of sorrow. Um, another word that uh, this takes on is uh, lament. This is, uh, this whole idea, just like it just runs deep throughout the Bible. You see it in so many different places um, where people, they, they recognize, they they 
they see what's happening in the world around them. They see what's happening to their community. They see what's happening to their friends and they see what's happening to their city and they see what's happening um, to their family. They, they just see all of this, this type of destruction that, that's happening. And the Bible always sort of like, it, it draws out this, this idea that when people see this um, dev- type of devastation that it causes them to lament. And to lament is to is to basically say, God, this world needs you and nothing else. That there's without you all hope is lost. They they recognize, you know, that the world is in, in complete and utter chaos and turmoil. I mean, let's just on let's be honest like, we recognize that the world with, without God is in complete turmoil right um, you see violence you see destruction you see corruption you see all of these things and and you just you, you see how it, it, it wreaks havoc on the lives of people that you know and people that um, you don't know people that you are acquaintances with and, and you look and you go man this is um, this is awful if you're just downright honest, you just say, this is completely awful, God. Let's do something. That is the, that's the, the start of a lament. And, and there's, you know, there's lots of these throughout um, the Old Testament. And they all point to this idea, I am deeply sorry. I regret deeply. Actually, in um, Judges, uh, it's, it actually uses this phrase that, um, that God, when he saw the wickedness of man, he regretted it. As in Genesis, I'm sorry, that's Genesis chapter 6. He regretted, he pentheoed making man because of their wicked ways. That's interesting, that's interesting. But also in Genesis chapter 6, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of when... Um, God starts to do something about man's wicked ways. It's the beginning. Some would say it's the beginning of, uh, of the history of redemption. Is that the whole Bible after that point just talks about how God, what God is doing with all of this stuff going on in the world. Um, and it culminates in Jesus Christ, which is very, very good news. Um, so, uh, Pentheo is the deepest expression of sorrow, is regret, to lament. Um, Parakaleo, uh, actually it means to, in a sort of passive way, to call near, to come to one's side. Um, there's another definition, Thayer's uh, Greek lexicon puts it this way, that um, it's, it's to, to receive refreshment. So the, the beatitude is balanced with this like this idea of lament. Like when we, you know, so so Jesus is saying, blessed are blessed are those those who mourn what's happening in the world, but for they shall receive refreshment. You you see like there's there's a there's a dichotomy there's a there's a contrast between two very very uh, different ways of being. One of those is like wow okay if I just um, if, I, if I'm sorry and I lament for what's happening in the world that the Lord, in his mercy and his kindness, he gives me his presence to refresh me. That's a good word, right? Yeah. But the idea of lament goes so much, so much deeper than just being um, sorry for what's happening in the world from, you know, a 30,000 foot perspective. Um, Lament throughout the Bible always takes a very, very personal dimension where it's like something is happening in in the the community and it's being identified by uh, the writer and they begin to to weep and to mourn and to to feel sorrow for what's happening. Um, But they they drive this broad sort of event out from, you know, the fringe of your life into a very deeply personal experience with God. Turn to Nehemiah chapter one. You'll see this. Um, Give you a minute. (laughs) 
This is Nehemiah chapter 1, um, verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. In the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have burned with fire. And when I heard these things, get this, verse four, I sat down and wept. And for some days I mourned, I pentheoed and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So this is the beginning of his lament. He's, so uh, what's happening, right? So context, the, the Israel or Jerusalem has been destroyed. There's a group of people who didn't get carried off. They stayed. They actually became the people of the land. Um, but Nehemiah, he asks, what's, what's life like for them? What's life like in Jerusalem? And he hears that the city has been, you know, utterly destroyed. The temple has been destroyed. The walls of the city have been destroyed. And the people, they are living in shame and disgrace because all of this has happened. And he begins to lament. It's, he, he mourns. He, he has the deepest expression of sorrow and grief and regret for what has happened. And that's, you know, he's lamenting. He's crying. He begins to cry out to God to set things right. And just listen to his prayer. It's not on the screen, but listen to his prayer. You follow along with me in your Bible. Uh, verse five, he says, this is his prayer. Oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel. So he's praying for the people of Israel, right? He's lamenting for them. Night for the, the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. So pause there right before we get to verse eight. So he's, he takes his lament from being, wow, there's, like a, there's something really going on here. There's something wrong. The world, is in, as, as he knew it, was in utter destruction. Uh, Nehemiah, probably at this point in his life, was, um, he, he probably left Jerusalem towards the end of its destruction. So he probably had memories of, a, um, as a boy, you know, running the streets of, you know, what we would call the Jewish quarter today. Um, he, he recalled running those streets with his friends, playing games, he remembered at its height the glory and his beauty. That he remembered the, the, the temple as, as it stood. And all of that had been destroyed. And so he's thinking, wow, this is, this is really bad. I can't believe the state of things. And he's, he's invoking, and when he starts out, he starts to, to invoke God's covenant-keeping nature. You are a, a covenant-keeping God. And then... He turns it, I'm going to pray, Lord, that you would, you would forgive our sin as a people. So notice this. Like he, he takes this, his lament, his, deep, uh, his deepest regret, and he begins to take his deepest regret and cry out to God for forgiveness from what they had done, which was they turned to idols. They didn't keep the first commandment. First commandment, love the Lord your God with all of, no, 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 that's not it. Um, you shall have no other God before me. Sorry, I'm thinking of the New Testament. Uh, that's Jesus' first commandment. Um, have no other God before me was, was the first commandment. And they didn't do that. 
from the, the days they entered into the promised land, like the, the, moment, the moment that Joshua died and things began to, to take, take, take a dramatically different direction. They began to worship other gods. They placed uh, idols uh, higher than, than God himself. They had ideas and thoughts and different, you know, all these things that were higher than the God of Israel. And they worshiped them, and they bowed down to them, and they sacrificed to them. They, they just um, became, as a result of all of that, be, they became utterly corrupt. And so, Nehemiah sees the cause and effect. He sees like, okay, God, uh, we didn't do this. Or you, the, the city is now destroyed, and the prophets spoke that this was gonna happen. Um, the God, we, our city's destroyed because of this. And he begins owning the national sin of Israel. He begins owning what it is that's their corruption. And then, you know, get this, in his, and he's repenting of this. He's, he drives even deeper. He goes, it's not just them, but I am a part of this. I, I am like, in, I confess my sin. Right, so so this is this is sort of what I think Jesus is driving at with the uh, uh, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who pentheo, blessed are those who lament, because they see the the disaster that has happened in this this world because of the fall, because of the the corruption that that mankind has taken on, and then the lament goes a step further, and we begin to go oh. I'm a part of this. It's like an aha moment in the midst of, in the midst of our, our lament that we realize I, I am a part of all of that. I had a part to play in all of that. And so lament, lament goes in this trajectory where we, we, we cry out for God to change the world. And in the midst of that crying out for God to change the world, we realize that we're this is the way that things are the way they are. And then we realize things are the way they are because I'm human. So this is his lament, confessing, we, confessing the sins of the people of Israel. We have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. And what he was saying is we, even in our house, we had idols. They had a little, probably a little shrine that they kept of the household gods of, the, of, of Canaan. And uh, they, they probably worshiped to them and looked to them and thought, you know, oh, these, these types of things are gonna uh, help us in this world. So he's confessing, he's confessing that. We have acted very corruptly against you and not kept the commandments, the statutes, the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. In verse eight, he goes on, remember the word that you commanded your your servant Moses saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the people. And this is also what he said to Moses. But if you return to me, which throughout the Old Testament and even into the New Testament, this, this phraseology is so important. Anytime you read this, you just know this is the, the writer is using a very direct term to point to this idea of repentance. It's, so he says, even if you return to me, or if you repent and keep my commandments and do them. Though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of the heaven. I love that. He just, he's describing it. You, you all are scattered to the wind. You're like the stars in the sky. You are all over the planet, all over the universe. You're as far away from each other as people can get. Even in that state, God's promises, from there I will gather them and I'll bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. And they are your servants and your people whom you've redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. Oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight 
to fear your name and give success. I love this. This is kind of the main thrust here. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who is this man? Uh, the next verse is, I was a cupbearer for the king. So he's referring to the king. He wants success with the king. And that's the, the story of Nehemiah. Uh, so Nehe, Nehemiah's lament, his mourning, was a, here's the big problem. There's a big problem here. We repent. I repent. God, do something. Do something with me. Use me. And often, like, this is like, sometimes we, we lament about what's happening in the world, but we don't go actually far enough to say, use me in this problem, God? Have you ever found yourself, like you look at, you watch the news and you go, man, I, there's such problems in this world. And, um, you know, we just sort of, you know, lead, God, would you help these people? And we, we don't actually, you know, sort of, you ever, in sports, you ever watch like, you know, I love football games where like the, um, you see this a lot. Um, it's the, the hubris, I think it's the hubris of, of athletes, professional athletes. They, they run towards the end zone and uh, usually when they get to about the, you know, five or 10 yard line, um, they, they like, oh, I'm gonna make this leaping jump into the end zone. And you ever see where they don't make it? They just fall flat on their face. And I sometimes, I think in our lament, we, we get there. Like we, we see, we recognize there's a problem. We're like, okay, I see, the, I see the, what the touchdown looks like. I see what it looks like to win in this area. But we, we just sort of leave it as like, well, God, you just worked that out. And the, the, uh, the biblical idea of Pentheo is that we have such a regret and remorse that we're willing to jump in and begin working towards a solution. For us to do that, though, it requires something. Acknowledgement of how we fit into the whole thing. The problem that we have with, as, as humans. What part do we play? Where, where do I need God to change me, right? It's not just God changed the world, but where do I need God to change me so that he can change me in such a way that I can enter into the problem and become a solution to the problem. That is Pentheo. Lamentations. I'll just give you kind of an overview. Lamentations is a book that is one whole lament. And the first three chapters are just darkness. It's just nothing but darkness. Darkness, darkness, darkness. Uh, Jeremiah is, is recalling the destruction of the, the city of Jerusalem from within, right? So he is cataloging. This is what it's like to be in a city that's, that's being destroyed. And um, he, um, he writes, he spends the first three, three and a half chapters on that whole thing. Then it's like, in the midst of all of that darkness, there's like a peak of light. And that's verse 23, right? We know this. This is for your faithfulness, God endures to the end. Your mercies are new every morning. And from then on after that is this, is this repentance that happens where he's talking about the, the national sins of his nation and then he begins talking about the part that he's played in that. You get this? So, the book closes, and of course, he uses the classic phrase in verse 40, return, Lord, we return to you. Which is, again, a key phrase about repentance. Anytime you see that, there's a, a note, like, the author is going, this is, a, this is a key phrase. And the book closes with a plea for God to set things right, to change the world. And of course, we know that Jeremiah was involved in turning Israel back to the Lord um, through the book of Jeremiah. Um, 
Psalm 51. This is David's cry of repentance. Um, halfway through, you know, so the first half, he's talking about, wow, this is, this is the, the song that he wrote after Nathan the prophet came and exposed his sin about uh, Bathsheba, right? So uh, the, Nathan goes, hey, so uh, David, say you knew a guy who had a sheep, uh, but you were a, a, a wealthy sheep farmer and you had plenty of sheep, but you liked the sheep of the, the, the other guy, and so you devised a plan to take his sheep. What would you do? And David goes, well, I'd put that guy to death. He deserves it. And then Nathan goes, that's you, man. You, okay, and so he, and he gets on his face and he starts to cry out and he calls out to God in Psalm 51 as a result. Um, he's confessing his sin, confessing his sin and um, get this, this is his uh, song of repentance. He says, clean, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with your willing spirit. Then I will teach, this, get this, then I will teach you, transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. See, David, his lament was about his personal problem. And then he recognized, wait a minute, this might actually be, this might actually be more of a us problem. Like maybe this is, this is, this is a sin that we all face. And so David is, is definitely connecting like, well, okay, so there's this big problem that's happening in me and I think this whole big problem is happening in the community. So he takes a little bit kind of the opposite direction where he starts with himself, then works out into the community. But at the core is this idea, like we, we have to, as a people, we have to repent so that we could be restored to the joy of our salvation. Do you, you, you get what Jesus, you get what Jesus is saying? I mean, when he, he says, blessed are those who mourn for thou sh they shall receive comfort. You get it. That's the, that's the, if you could extrapolate the words of Jesus and sort of fill in a whole lot of, you know, like blanks, that's what he's saying. He's just like he's, and he's giving, I think, a summary statement of this. And the summary statement is, you know, and this is, the, this, is, this is where lament takes us, is that when we want God to change the world, we have to kind of adopt this idea that God wants to change us first. I say that again. If we want God to change the world, if we're unhappy with the way things are going and the, the destruction that's happening around us, then invite God to change you first. Because in changing us, the world gets changed. Repentance, I'll say this, repentance is always, is always the starting point of revival. It always is. When we want God to do a new thing, we recognize what's wrong and what's not right. We repent, we own our part in that, and we ask God to change us so that we're not like that anymore. And we ask him to do a new thing. See, I am doing a new thing. He says to the prophet Isaiah, to the prophet Zechariah, in his call to repentance of Israel, he says in verse three, therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says. This is one of the greatest promises in all of scripture. Return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you. This is the beatitude. Mourn for what's happening and the blessedness that you receive is the comfort from God that he is with you. Return to me and I will return to you. This, this idea, just, it, it just runs throughout the New Testament. That language. Uh, yeah. 
repentance, probably sitting here going, man, I think he's telling me to repent. Yes. In case you're wondering, yes, I am telling you to repent. Um, as believers, as followers of Jesus, as his, as, as his disciples, repentance is key in our life. It's key in the Gospels. Um, in the Gospels, it takes on three different forms. There's, a, um, there's an internal like there's an internal like reality, there's a relational reality that we have to acknowledge that, that we are separated from God, that there's something in our life that is, is separating us from having more of God, for, for having, from having um, what God wants to do in us and through us out in the world. There's something that's preventing that from happening. And as followers of Jesus, we have to become aware of that. Um, because and this is not a, this is not a popular statement. Holiness matters to God. It matters to Him. There's an internal aspect, and then there's a behavioral change. Repentance takes on those three things. But in our day and age, repentance is not popular, is it? And it's, it's not popular for you know, three reasons. The, f the first reason is that um, postmodernism, uh, just gonna kind of go out into sort of a heady, so bear with me here. There's this idea that happens and is happening in culture. It's been happening for a long time. Um, and what has happened as a result of postmodernism is uh, people have become uh, morally relativistic. Okay, so what we say is like, well, we've got, um, uh, this is how this manifests. Like, you, what's, what's right for you is different for me, right? So we, we, we say that as a, as a people. Like, well, you know, um, I, there is no, you know, absolute truth. And so truth for me is, you know, different than truth for you. And this, these are all postmodern ideals. Um, but it, it's sort of... Uh, generates in this 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 belief that as far as some sort of like moral compass there really isn't one that exists that every person this is postmodernism not every person and i i, I reject this idea wholly um that every person has a a, a moral compass different from the person next to him and so therefore you know we all just kind of do whatever you know we think is right. That's the, the essence of postmodernism right there. The, um, which, is, which is really problematic. It is really problematic. And if you want to, want to know why it's problematic is because um, in our life, in our world that we live in today, uh, there, is a, there are competing ideas of right and wrong, aren't there? Yeah. You probably had that conversation this week. You sound like you did. Post-postmodernism runs in this sort of idea that uh, runs in the direction that um, uh, you just, you know, do whatever you feel like. And that manifests in statements like, well, live your truth, right? And I, or, or live your own truth. And that's, that's, I, that's, I have a problem with that because that statement um, I know, like some people say in a very innocent fashion, but also I think, is that like as followers of Jesus, should we really be living our own truth? Or should I be living the truth of Jesus? Like, because, you know, the, the Bible doesn't point me in the direction that says, well, just do whatever you feel like and live your truth in the midst of that. The the Bible, the Bible and the Gospels of Je the Gospel of Jesus Christ points me in the direction of Him. Live according to Him. Follow Him. That's the essence of being a disciple. You're looking at Jesus, who has paved the way for you. He has given you the Holy Spirit through His death and His resurrection to be able to walk in His way. We live in the truth of Jesus, not in the truth of me. Uh, 
And so again, like this whole idea, like, oh, just, you know, do whatever you feel like, live your truth. Um, it rejects the idea of any type of wrong. That there, there's not a problem in this world and the problem definitely doesn't have anything to do with me. Because I'm, I'm living a truth that I'm creating. So that's, but that's the, the culture of the world. The other issue is secularism. And secularism drives like people into this, these holes. They're okay with spirituality. That's the, the, actually, the, the, the wonderful thing about post-postmodernism that I, I can say, like, I really like that, is that people are more open to spirituality than they've ever been. Like in, in a, in a post-modern society, people are like, oh, no, no, I reject all form of spirituality. There is no you know, higher power in this universe. There's just nothing. And that's what they say. But in post-postmodernism, there's actually an openness to some sort of spiritual being. But secularism comes in and says, you can be spiritual, but only in private. It's okay for you to be a spiritual being. I'm totally cool with that. That's you. That's you living your thing. But whatever you do, keep it behind closed doors. And the, the problem with that is that when you start repenting, and you could you drive this, just people who have... Um, ongoing substance abuse issues. They're repenting. They have habitual addictions. They're repenting. They're trying to, to live for this. And then, you know, they, like they get into an atmosphere, and this is where secularism just sort of like kicks repentance in the teeth. Um, because it, you get into this environment where you're like, I'm, I'm, living, I'm, I'm living out my repentance. I have asked God to change me from the, the very core of my being. And that that change to flow out of me. And you can't, in today's world, you can't talk about that because it's, it's, it's spiritual. And in a secular society, you can't talk about what the spirit is doing within you because they don't want to hear about it. The world needs to hear about it. Understand it, what God is doing in you, how he's changing you, how he's reshaping your life, how your behavioral patterns have changed as a result of, of your, your, your inward spiritual condition. The fruit of your repentance needs to be heard by the world. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, all right, I got to... I gotta land the plane here. Repentance is unpopular. Um, but this is, I think, what Jesus is saying. And if I were going to rewrite Matthew 5 4, if I were gonna do a translation, that I think is faithful to what Jesus is really saying, it would say this, blessed is the one who turns back to God for they are no longer alone. We have returned to God and he will return to us. If you've ever wondered in your life, why do I feel such a dry spiritual existence why is you know I see people who are, it seems like they have living waters flowing from within them the question I have to ask you is is there something that's preventing those spiritual waters from flowing if the beatitudes are, are ancient riverbeds that the living waters flow through our lives out into the world is there something in, in you that is causing a a a lack of flow. You get me? All right, let's stand. Alex, why don't you come out here? Or up here, wherever you're at. There you are. I, I think that 
And I believe this, the core of my being, that God's people are at their best when they're in just a posture of repentance. Like we will, we will be, and this is, like there's so much of the, the New Testament that just drives at this point. Like we as a people are all constantly turning back to the Lord. It's almost like in our lives, like there's a, there's a constant need for us, um, you know, as the, as the world sort of uh, rotates, you know, around the sun as it orbits the sun and it has its own little, you know, spin. Uh, it's, it's like, in a way, it's always turning away from the sun. And I think sometimes in our lives, like we, we can just like naturally, like we can become um, numb to what God is doing in, in the world and what God is doing, wants to do in our lives and what God wants to do in our families and what God wants to do. Like we can just sort of just get in a, get in a pattern of living that just sort of, you know, turns away from God. Ever so gradually, we just, like the earth, just turns away from the sun. And, and I, I think as believers, like there's, there's, a, there's power to be had for the church and us making a, a regular practice of just saying, I'm, I'm gonna turn back to God today. I, I don't know what it is in my life that maybe I need to repent. I just don't feel like I've done anything or, you know, but I think that there's, a, there's a, a coming back to the Lord daily that we have to do. And in that, we, we experience the, the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. We experience the presence of God in our lives. We begin to experience the, the boldness uh, of, of a life that flows from the Spirit. We have, to, we have to recognize our tendency to just turn away from the Lord gradually and overcome that and say, I'm turning back to you, God. I'm returning to you. Return to me. So as we close today, um, I just, I want, to, I want to give you space. Before you leave today, I want to give you an invitation just to come you know, up front here and just you spend some time with the Lord. Just say, Lord, I'm coming back to you to grieve, to mourn what it is that, that, that is happening in the world and what it is that, that's within you that could keep you from causing some change in the world that you'd like to see. So as we close today, just, I'm going to give you an invitation um, just to come and spend some time with the Lord. Alex is going to play some music. Uh, our ministry team is going to, going to be around. They're going to just lay a hand on you and pray for you. They're going to bless you. So I just invite you to do that. You can come now if you would like. I'll pray as you're making your way forward. Father, as a church, we, we come back to you. We acknowledge, Lord, that, that there's, a, there's a gravitational pull that, that reorients our life away from you to the things of this world. And Lord, today, we, we, by our own volition, we overcome that force and turn back to you. We grieve, God. We lament the problems that we see in this world. We, we, we recognize, Lord, that it is, it is so far off track from what you originally planned, that the only thing that can save it is you, God. And we don't just passively, we don't passively engage, you know, in that, in that thought, like, oh yeah, God, you do something about it. But Lord, change us at the very core of our being. Change our heart, change our mind, change our behavior. Let there be a fruit, Lord, of our turning back to you. Let it, God, let it God be in, in, in power. Let it God be in, in purity. Let it God be in the, uh, the, the sharing of the gospel, the sharing of what you're doing in our lives, the overcoming of the, the ways of this world so that, Lord, people can hear your message afresh and that they could turn to you. We come back to you, God. 
we turn to you. Would you, Lord, fulfill your promise and return to us? Would you come, Holy Spirit? We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, if you want just to spend some time with the Lord, I just invite you to do that. Maybe you will just want to do it at your seat. That's cool. But don't leave here today without acknowledging, God, I need you. I need you. More than anything else in this world, I need you. Amen. God bless you.